Well, we are in Revelation <laughs> chapter 12. Oh, All right. That's right. All right. Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter 12. We'll let these youngins get upstairs before we start. Widely go upstairs, please. Revelation chapter 12. Yes, ma'am. Romans, Paul, more than likely. Uh huh. Oh, the weird name? Yes, yes, he was a scribe. He was a scribe. See, Paul didn't actually write his letters. Like, they was a scribe that would write them. Onesimus oh, was his name, I think. Was that it? It was a weird name? Yes. Yeah. He was like a scribe. Yes, yes. It, many people think and, and give it to the Apostle Paul as his writing, but I don't know if anybody's sure or not. But it's, it's much like his writings in other, <laughs> other letters. But it does say that at the end of it. I, such Onesimus or whatever that name was, so yes, yes, that's right, that's right. Yes, I've read that before, absolutely. All right, praise God. Well, we're going to jump right in Revelation chapter number 12. Uh, if y'all remember with us last week, we talked about uh, the great sign that appeared in heaven. And what was it? Does anybody remember? That's right, that's right, right, right. <laughs> That's right. I was on it. You got I, I, I hear you. I hear you're saying it. I lost my words. That's right. It was about the sign that appeared in heaven. Uh, the woman in the Bible says there was a sun over her head and the moon. And then 12 stars was underneath her, under her feet. And on her head was a garland of 12 stars. Excuse me. Was on her head and a garland of 12 stars. And then it says, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Brother Randall, you come at a good night tonight. Because it sounds kind of crazy, don't it? We went over that last week. He's going to go work and tell everybody tomorrow. But he's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, he's a nut. He's talking about a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. But we'll, we'll explain it just a minute. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And let me read the next one. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God and to his throne. Now, does anybody remember who this woman symbolized at the very beginning? Does anybody remember? Israel. Israel. Israel, that's right. Israel. And we talked about how a lot of people, they often interpret this wrong. And um, I believe it's Charles Spurgeon. He, he said, wrote these words. And he said, you can tell a lot about people about how they interpret Revelation chapter 12. Because if we get this chapter wrong, then you're going to interpret the rest of Revelations wrong. We got to know who the scripture is talking about, and, and so a lot of people say that the woman that the Bible is talking about here is Mother Mary. Of course, that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, but we'll find out tonight why it can't be Mother Mary. I know it kind of sounds like it. It does. It kind of sounds like it could be Mary, but we'll find out tonight for sure why it's not. A lot of people say it's the church, but we know it can't be the church because the church. Uh, Jesus birthed the church, not the other way around. We didn't birth Jesus and so on. But then it goes on to say, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth, and another son appeared in heaven, a great fiery red dragon. Who's that red dragon? Does anybody remember? The devil. The devil Satan, that's right. He's a, known as the dragon or a serpent. 
having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Now, for the sake of my buddy being here tonight, I just want to clarify. The Bible is not talking about uh, a real literal dragon with seven heads and ten horns. I told you the reason why this was wrote last week in Scripture is because uh, a lot of Revelation had to be wrote symbolically. Because if the Apostle John, if he would have got caught writing this on the island of Patmos, and the Roman guards would have seen that, that he's actually talking about Rome, and he's actually talking about all this spiritual warfare and different things, if the Roman guards would have got their hands on that, Paul, or excuse me, John would have probably been executed, and you and I would not have the last book of the Bible. But you see, God saw fit to give it to him, he anointed his, his ears and his eyes to, to see what the Lord was showing him. And John wrote these words this way because, Randall, just like what I was saying, you're going to call me crazy. When the Roman guards read what John was writing, a dragon with seven heads and ten horns, they probably laughed at him and said, man, this guy's crazy. You just go ahead and do whatever you're doing. Keep writing your little novel or whatnot, your comic book, and... They let him go on. And that's how you and I ended up with the book of Revelation. But you know, I love it because God is so genius in what he does. Because God knew that it may sound foolish to the world and it may sound foolish to them Roman guards, but to you and I who have spiritual ears to hear and spiritual eyes to see, you and I know exactly what the Bible is talking about. Amen? Amen. 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 We, we understand what he's saying here and that it is symbolic. The word revelation, a lot of people think it's, it's a lot of stuff that's hid here. But the word revelation actually means apocalypso, which means the uncovering of, the revealing of. This is not God hiding his word. This is God showing you his word. This is God pointing his word and, and trying to show you and reveal to you and we must pray every time we study God's Word, we must always pray that God would open up our eyes, spiritual eyes, and our ears and our heart to receive this Word. Brother Bill, to some people, this is just another book. Amen. To some folks, Sister Michelle, this is just another uh, ink on some paper. But to those of us who know their God, and to those of us who love His Word, to those of us who love Him and, and want to know more, those of us who want to have a relationship with Him and walk with Him, Sister Monica, this Word comes alive in us and we begin to live it and, and let it be a road map and let it be His love letter to His church. You know, back in school, where's my wife at? Woo, all right, I about got in trouble. Back in school, when you get them love letters, y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I didn't know where to school was up. Anyways, you know how it makes you feel? It makes you, you still get a love letter. <laughs> there you go. You know what? How it would make you feel? It would make you feel all ooey gooey inside. And then, you know, you, you know you was loved. Let me tell you what. This word right here ought to make us feel that way. There you go, bro. Every time you open up this word, it ought to make you feel ooey gooey inside. It ought to make you feel loved. It ought to make you feel special because this is God's love letter to you and to I, to his bride. You see, when a groom would take a bride, what would he do? He would leave them and he would say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again. Same words Jesus told to his church in John chapter 14. If I go, I'm coming back again. I don't know what day. I don't know what hour. But I want you to keep your wedding garment on. I want you to be pure and waiting on me. Because when I come, I'm going to sound an alarm. And you're going to know I'm coming. I want you to make sure you've got your lamps trimmed and full of oil. Does anybody know where I'm going with this? Yeah. Woo, glory to God. Devil trying to give me a cramp in my leg right now. <laughs> Devil is a liar. Let me tell you what that means. That means you need to have your lamps trimmed and full of oil. How do you get oil? This word right here. 
How do you get oil? You seek God. How do you seek God, Brother Chad? I'm glad you asked. You fall on your knees and begin to pray and call out on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Open His Word and let God speak to you. Brother Steve Maud, I want you to know something, brother. Uh, a lot of people seek God's voice in many ways. But the largest way, the greatest way God speaks to us nine times out of ten is through this word. It is through God's word. He will speak to you if you will listen. Praise God. But anyways, you know what? This, this word right here works to just amaze us and, and energize us. Because it was written to you. <laughs> Think about it. If there was nobody else here, God would have still sent his love letter to you and you alone because he loves you that much. So he, the Bible says there was a, another sign appeared. That, that the woman was Israel. And we'll find that out in a moment. And Israel gave birth to a child. And we know Jesus Christ, who this male child is. Jesus come through the seed line of Israel. He come from the seed line of Judah, the tribe of Judah. The, the, does anybody remember what Judah represents? We just hit on that very shortly. I thought I heard somebody say it. King, that's right. It was the king's tribe. That's, that's where the kings of Israel, that's who they come through, was the tribe of Judah. Woo. And so if you ever read in the Bible where Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's pretty much saying he is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. You see, he come the first time as a lamb slain, Brother Dave, but he's coming back this time as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Praise God. He's not coming back to be murdered. He's coming back to rule and reign with a rod of iron. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he's coming back with all power in his hand. And so the Bible said that uh, Israel, and, and we know that's Israel because the book of Genesis is the very first place this was mentioned in. Genesis chapter number 37, I believe it was. That's where the woman was first mentioned throughout the whole Bible. Remember we talked about that last week? About the law of first mention? Anywhere you see something in the scripture, if you don't understand it, get you a concordance, a strong concordance, and go back and look it up. As it, was this ever mentioned before in the Bible? And it's so amazing. And you will see how those verses fit together and you'll understand it better. And so the Bible said there was another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fire, red dragon, having seven horns, he had ten horns, seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. <laughs> so we're seeing right here that the Bible said that this red dragon, he's got an issue with the woman. Who's the woman again? Israel. Israel. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. So Satan has a problem with Israel. That is why you have seen throughout your lifetime and ever since the beginning, you have seen Israel being under attack. You know, it, it wouldn't just a few years ago, Brother Dennis, that Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the prime minister of Israel, that Netanyahu sat down and was talking with this guy from China. And China told, the guy from China told Benjamin Netanyahu, he said, you know, it's amazing that the Chinese people and the Israelis and the Indians, the people from India, he said that we can trace our heritage back over 5,000 years. You see, Americans, we can't do that, can we? We can only go back just a few hundred years. But the people of Israel, they can trace their heritage back up to 5,000 years. And they were talking about this. And, and China said, we can trace ours back up to 5,000. And India said, we can trace ours back up to 5,000 years ago. And, but what was crazy about this was, was there's like 1.3 billion Indians from India. There's 1.6 billion Chinese. Does anybody want to take a guess how many Israelis, Israelites? 
13 million. China has 1.3 billion or 1.6. India has 1.3 billion. Israel has 13 million. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because Satan has a problem with a woman. And ever since the very beginning, Satan has tried to take Israel out because Satan knows that Israel is God's chosen place, is God's chosen people. And if God can start, the devil can stop Israel, then he can stop God. <coughs> because Israel must be a nation, it must be a people, or God's word is a lie, Brother Randall. Now I'm going somewhere with this. You see, ever since the very beginning when Pharaoh, Satan, got into Pharaoh or God, the Bible actually said God hardened his heart. God did it. God did it. Every time Moses went to him to try yes. to get his people set free, he would harden Pharaoh's heart. That's right. Much more so that he could build his own testimony. Yes. Court, That's it. That's it. Yes. And, and see, Pharaoh, he tried to go after Once he finally released Israel, then he got to thinking in his head, this is where Satan come in. Then he got to thinking in his head. And he said, I got to go get them. Why did I let those people go? I don't know why I did. It. I tell you why I did it, because God told him to. Yeah. But anyways, he let them go, and then he wanted to go capture them. He had a man slavery for 430 years. But to make a long story short, Pharaoh uh, suppressed and oppressed the children of Israel. Who was next? Herod. Herod tried to kill all the male children <laughs> under two years old. He tried to, he was uh, anti-Semitic. He wanted the people of Israel to die. He wanted their seed line to go. Who was next? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler killed so many Jewish people, the Israelis. And, and listen, all throughout the Bible, all throughout history, you will read and find out that the Jewish people, the people of Israel, has been under attack ever since the beginning. And finally, the, for up until the last several thousand years, Israel has not even been a nation. Up until 1948, that's when they become a nation again. But you find out that they are scattered so far abroad. And now there's only 13 million that are in Israel. That's, that's why. Because they have been martyred and killed and, and, and just beaten and tortured. And Why is little old Israel, China, so big, sis? India is so big compared to little old Israel. Why do they want Israel like that? Because they are threatened not by Israel but by the God of Israel. Yes, ma'am. He's a Jewish, yes. In Ukraine. I have heard they have their own little place, uh, their own little, whatever you want to call that. Community, community yes. That, I don't know what they call it, but it's, it's a big place that is in Ukraine. It may, you know, it could be. <coughs> exactly. Uh -huh. There you go. That's it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you know, Ukraine is actually considered by a lot of people to be ancient Magog. So if you read in Ezekiel chapter 38, it starts talking about Gog and Magog going to battle against Israel. And that's what's going to bring the coming again of the Lord. But you got to think Gog and Magog. You got Russia and Ukraine. Russia is Gog. Ukraine, they say, is ancient Magog. So if Putin takes over Ukraine, then the farm, the prophecy this is that much. And I don't want to see that, but you know, it's just that much more. It's outstanding. We'll get into that another time. But Israel has always been under attack. It's this is why? Because the dragon wants to destroy the woman. Satan wants to destroy Israel and God's people. And so the Bible says, His tail drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Remember, as soon as Jesus was born, Herod made the decree, kill all the male children at two years old and younger. 
And so the Bible says, Then the woman, or she bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This tells you right here who it is. Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. She bore a male child who was to what? Rule all nations with a rod of iron. Let me flip a couple pages to Revelations 19. Revelation 19, verse 15. This is what the Bible says. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. This tells you right here who it is. This male child is Jesus. Of course, we probably knew that because it said her child was called up to God and to his throne. Called up. You know, I, I can think of a couple others that were called up. Sister Diane, and I love talking about them. There's two others that's been called up. Ooh, Moses or uh, Elijah and Enoch. Elijah and Enoch. We was talking about Moses and Elijah the other night, the other day. That's what guys brought. We were talking about this Sunday. Yeah, talked about Sunday. That's right. There was two others. You know, the Bible says in the Book of Genesis, uh, rendered that uh, Enoch was a friend of God. He walked with God. God come down and he walked with him. Had a relationship with him. Talked with him. I'm talking about. Wouldn't that be so amazing? Guess what? You can do that. That's right. You can do that today. Walk with God. Talk with Him. Have a relationship with Him. And see, Enoch walked with God in the cool of the day. And the Bible said that Enoch was walking one day and he was no more. The way I picture this in, in Brother Chad's terms is the Lord looked over there at Enoch and said, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to yours. You're coming home with me today. <laughs> Amen. That's how close God and Enoch were. See, I believe if the church would get that kind of relationship with God, that God would just talk with you and, and show himself to you and, and take you by the hand. Wouldn't it be amazing if God just called us up? Well, it's coming. Amen. Revelation chapter 4, the Bible said, I heard a voice saying, come up here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible said, in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. We shall all be changed and we shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's coming. It's coming, church, one day. And so the Bible said that this guy, this male child was caught up. Caught up to God and to his throne. We know Jesus is the only one that's been caught up to his throne. Oh, praise the Lord. I wish I'd go on on that some more. But anyway... So the male child is Jesus. Then the woman who is who? Israel. Fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her 1,260 days. So we got to understand right here, first of all, it's talking about Israel. If it was Mother Mary, it's hard to picture Mother Mary because this sign happened in heaven. It didn't happen on the earth, so it's hard to picture Mother Mary having a child in heaven. Amen? Amen. Listen, so well, it, listen, it talks, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. I love that. That word prepared right there is the exact same word prepared that was used in John 14. We just said it a moment ago. I go to prepare a place for you. So let's understand something here. This is beautiful if you hear it. This is what this amazes me. Because God is going to heaven to prepare a place for us. But the same God that works in heaven also works in this earth. Because he's preparing a place for us. And then he's preparing a place for his people Israel. Mm. Now see Israel... We'll make it to heaven according to Romans chapter number 11. The Bible said that they will, their eyes will be open. But that's why the tribulation has to happen because they have rejected Jesus and they're going to see in Revelation 19, they shall see Jesus coming back. 
Oh, praise the Lord. And they're going to say, our Messiah. Their eyes will be open and they will be saved, the ones that are left alive. But anyway, so God prepares a place for the church in heaven. He prepares a place in the wilderness. We'll find out where and what it's talking about in just a second. A place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. That 1,260 days, can anybody tell me how long that is? Three years. Three and a half. Three and a half years. That's three and a half years. <laughs> you was close. You just rounded up a little okay, bit. So, yeah, never mind. Go ahead. Keep going. That's All right. right. That's half of seven. Continue on. That's half of seven. That's it. Yeah. This is going to happen at the last part, the mid part of the tribulation, the last three and a half years. But this is going to start it. And the Bible said, or the woman fled to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. This is what is amazing. There is a place over there, Brother Bill, that is actually by the Jordan River, and it is a stone. It is a home that's made out of the wall, made out of stone. It's called Petra, and it's where all the Israelites have been for years, ever since 1948. Nobody knows exactly why they've been doing this, but the Israeli people has been going to Petra. They have been carving out walls and carving out homes out of stone, out of the mountainside. And they have been going in and storing up food and storing up tracks and storing up scrolls and storing up God's Word and many different things that they store in there. But could you, you think this might be the place that's prepared in the wilderness? You think God put it on their heart to go ahead? Who knows? But all I can tell you is this, is there is a place that is being prepared for them. There is a place. The Israeli people, the Jewish people, they will be, most, unless they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, if they're a Jew and an Israelite, if they have accepted Jesus when he comes, they're going to be called up too. But for the most part, most all of them, not all, but most, the biggest percentage has not accepted Jesus because they don't believe he was really the Christ. And anyways, it said, a place prepared by God that they should feed there, there, 1,260 days. Now, we're getting to the good point. Verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. This verse right here is beautiful. Praise God. The Bible said a war broke out in heaven. In the middle of the tree. But I thought, Brother Chad, I thought heaven was supposed to be a place of perfect peace. I thought heaven was supposed to be a place where love abounds. And, and there's not going to be any fighting. And, and there ain't going to be any bickering and fighting. Michael, I think we've got a specific job for a specific reason. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It just so happens at this specific time that we're talking about is the middle of the tribulation period. The last three and a half years. This is the very middle of it. And you'll see why. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. Who is the dragon again? Satan. Satan. Who is his angels? The third of that he brought down from heaven with him. There you go. You see, before Satan was the devil, he was Lucifer, son of the morning. Beautiful. Beautiful angelic being who led worship in heaven. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. It tells you all about it. His body parts was made as organs and they had diamonds and emeralds. They was beautiful to look upon. But what happened to Lucifer? He got to see. He got to see. He got prideful. And he began to say, I will be like God. I shall ascend to the throne. And he got to talking to some of God's angels. And he said, I believe if you join together with me, we can overthrow God. And we know that was a bad choice. All right, we'll talk about this. The first time Lucifer had his first fall. Brother Bruce, you know when that was? Jesus said, I was there. And I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, my daddy took his foot and he kicked Satan right in the rear end. And out the door of heaven he went. 
down to the earth. He fell like lightning, and Jesus said, I saw the whole thing. And I, I could just picture Jesus just propped up. Go, Daddy. That's my daddy. That's right. That's right. He's a fallen star. And he drew a third of those stars. A while ago we read that. He drew a third of the stars of heaven. That's what he's talking about. He drew a third of the angels of God with him. See, I always thought that they willingly went with him, but, but he actually... He, drew, he deceived them. As being stubborn, and yes. just jerk, jerked them out with him. He, he drew them with him, with, the, not with his tail, with his yes. deceit. Yes. He, he, See, I always thought that they went with him. Right. But, well, they chose to follow him by his by him telling them yeah. we can he be was like a God. Very charismatic speaker, and he, he yes. pretty much conned them right into it. They believed what he said, hook, line, and sinker. So when he fell, they took him with him. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. The Absolutely. The there you go. He's the same way today. He's a good speaker. That's right. Just like he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, he tempted them angels up there as well. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. They did. They did. Right. right. Yeah, hey, but the way when he got kicked out, they went with him. Oh, yeah. They got kicked out because of him. We'll put it that way. That's how he drew. They got kicked out because of him. They made the choice, but it was because of Satan. They got pulled out. Sure. Yes, sir. Well, look at that. If Satan can deceive angels, yeah. it is much easier for him to deceive humans than it is. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's right. And if he can deceive angels, it ain't no problem for him. Exactly. No, he, he's been doing it for many years, brother. He's been doing it for many years. And he's good at his job. He is very good at his job. He knows the Bible. That's right. That's right. We're going to find out in a minute. He's like a prosecutor. Yes. Yes. He, he, the Bible says that in the beginning, God had a lamb. That was slain before the foundation. So before all this ever happened, God already knew it. And he already had to look around. And all over heaven, there's nobody, nobody to go. But his son, Jesus, stepped out and said, I'll go. And so it's beautiful. Okay. Yes, sir. The dragon had ten parts and ten uh, uh, legs. Seven heads and ten horns. Yes, yes, the ten horns is, you can read, you can study that out of the book of Daniel. Uh, the ten horns, I believe it's Daniel, I, I say it's Daniel 7 or Daniel 9, right there. It's, but that whole, you need to read the whole thing, Daniel 7 through 9. Actually, Daniel 7 through 12, but chapter 7 through chapter 12 is the best, because it tells the whole story. But the ten horns is actually the ten kings that when Antichrist rises to power, uh, there's going to be ten kings in this earth that is going to make a confederation with the Antichrist. In other words, they're going to be like NATO. They're going to be like the United Nations. They're going to join forces with this very charismatic speaker, this very handsome, this charming. That's what the Antichrist is going to be. Didn't we do Daniel before we got Yeah, we've done Daniel before. That's right. That's right. I don't think they were with us at that point in time. I don't believe it was no, I didn't think. Yeah, we would just went through Daniel. I believe before we went. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it took a while. So the Bible says the war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, and what they did not prevail. In other words, nobody won. Nobody won, or nobody is going to win here because they are equal. They're equals. They're supernatural. They're not earthly. They're not bound to the flesh. Now, Brother Steve, God and Satan is not equal. When I say equal, I'm talking about Michael and Satan are equals. Michael was the head angel in heaven. Michael is the, he. you know, just like the Bible says in Ephesians 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. There's ranks. Just as there's ranks in the military, you've got your lieutenant, your general, your all this different stuff, your captains. There's ranks in the angelic beings. There's ranks in demonic spirit. And so we find out that Michael fought against Satan and his angels. 
And so we see here they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Look at verse number 9. So the great dragon, that's Satan, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Brother Chad, I thought the Bible said that God's already cast him out. He has. You see, Satan's going to fall four times. I don't know if everybody knows this or not. A lot of people think he's only going to fall once, but he's going to fall four times. The first time Satan fell was when he tried to ascend above God and God kicked him out, along with a third of the angels with him. But right now, Satan still has access to the throne of God. Heaven is not his home anymore, but he still has access to to enter to heaven any time he gets ready. Yeah. You see, God allows this for a reason. The, the Bible says that Satan, Job chapter 1, do y'all remember that story? The Bible says that Satan comes up to heaven. And God said, where you been, Satan? And Satan said, I've been walking to and fro in the earth looking for somebody, looking for somebody that I can attack, looking for somebody that I can steal from you. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered Job? In other words, God's like, I got somebody that's so anointed. I, I got somebody that loves me so much that I am willing to bet Satan, you can go attack all you want to. But you can't kill him. But you can do everything else. And I can just about guarantee you God looked at Satan and said, he's not going to deny me. Satan took that as a challenge. He said, challenge accepted, and he tried. But the Bible said the reason I told you that was because Satan just walked right into heaven. God said, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for somebody. Yeah. The Bible also says that Satan stands before God, and he's accusing you and accusing me. He's accusing us all the time. You know what? When we mess up, when we fall short, when we fall in sin, the devil says, God, huh, did you see them? They don't really love you. They're not really Christians. They're, they're failures. They don't have any care about you. They're living their life however they want to. But you know what? This is what happens. While the devil is looking at the Father and telling the Father this as a prosecutor, you know what? Brother Steve, the prosecutor does, he gets evidence on him. And then he takes it before the judge. And when he goes before that judge, he's going to make sure he's got everything lined up. He's going to make sure all the evidence is in his favor. And he's not going to go for that judge until he gets everything lined up just the way he wants it. That's the way Satan does. He's like a prosecutor. He'll go before the judge of all. And he'll say, I've got this evidence on your child. They messed up big time. They don't love you. But guess what happens? When the prosecutor goes to the judge, and then we have our advocate. We have our lawyer steps out. He's the man with the holes in his hands and in his feet. And he steps out and says, but Father... My grace is sufficient. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. When they're weak, that's when I'm strong, says the Lord. Listen, I'm thankful that when the accuser, the devil, is, is talking to the Father about you and me, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, steps out and says, I've already paid for that sin. Amen. I've already paid for it. Their sins are washed away by my blood. I'm thankful we have an advocate. He is a propitiator. That means, uh, well, I'll tell you what that means. Does anybody else know what that means? <laughs> our propitiator. He is the one that fights our cause. Jesus fights our cause for you and I. Don't nobody look that word up because I don't know if that's what it means or not. But that's the way I've always that's the way I've always read it. He fights for us, Jesus. He fights for us. It's he battle. He goes to battle for us. That's right, sis. He goes to battle for us. Amen. But anyways, this is what the Bible said. So they were cast out. Oh, I was trying to go over something. The first time he got cast out. The second time 
Satan gets cast out is right here when the war starts. In the middle of the tribulation period, God, they're, they're fighting, making war in heaven. So God the Father has to kick him out again. And this is what he does. He tells him, Satan, I've allowed you to have access into the throne room. But now you are going to be cast to the earth where you are limited in an earthly body. You are no longer welcome in heaven anymore. You cannot come back. You cannot show back up. You are bound to the earth. That's fall two. That's when Satan is bound and fallen the second time. Now, I can show you all this in other scriptures if you like in, in just a moment, but let me get through this part first. It says, he was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. You've got to understand something. No more devil, no more demons. They are cast down and they are made to be like you and I. There's a place in the Old Testament that says one of these days, that all of God's people is going to walk around when Satan is cast down that time and we're going to look at him on the ground and say, is this the man that put fear in the nations? Is this the man that we have been terrified of all of our life? This is the devil? That's there, church. It's in your Bible. I'll show it to you. So those angels that's with him too, are they bad? Angels? Yeah, yeah, they're demons. The, the angels that fell with Satan is demons. That's, that's what we call demons. But it's, you're right. That's exactly right. A lot of people allow demons to take up residence in them. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. Do what, brother? No, no, a lot of people don't believe in that. They just sort of don't. But I'm here to tell you something. Jesus cast out all kinds of devils. And Jesus, his own words, he said this. He said, in my name, I will give you power, first of all, to what? To cast out devils. Yeah. Devils is demons. To cast out demons. Now, a demon-possessed person does not always look like what Hollywood has made it to look like. They don't always they have their heads spinning around and around and throwing up green stuff. They all come in different forms and fashions. No, I've never seen one with her head spin around either. I have seen one that contorted, and this woman should not have yeah. dared, 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 been able to do so. Yeah. This woman probably, and I'm not making fun, I'm just stating the facts. This woman was over 400 pounds. I just got saved, and I wasn't been saved long. She's sitting in a chair in the living room in this house that I go to, and this woman is making some sounds that I have never heard a woman make. I'm talking about deep sounds. It's not her voice, it's another voice. Yeah. And she begins to twitch and she begins to contort. And this 400 pound woman is making moves. You know what I've done, Brother Steve? I'd have gotten wrong. I put my head between my legs. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, get me out of here. <laughs> I did. I said, Lord, in the name. And I was like, Sonny, let's go, let's go. And she'd been saved like a week longer than I had. And she's like, hmm. Oh, yeah. She tougher. she tougher than I am in that. Yeah, yeah, I was scared to death. I'd never seen this stuff before. But I'm talking about that's the way this one did. I have seen some come in the church, and when they started walking toward the altar, they would lay down on their belly and slither like a snake. We had that happen in a church just a few miles down the road. Y'all got broken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I hadn't been saved long at all, brother. It wasn't over a month. And I'm talking about this woman is doing all kinds of stuff, and the devil was out to get us that day. I was worried sick because I didn't know, you know, I read the Bible before, but I didn't take it to heart. That's it. That's it. But you know what? It's crazy because the guy that was actually there that was praying that demon out and trying to cast that demon out of her, that he come in, he's going around. Now that guy is a devil worshiper. Oh. Turned his back on God and is... That's very dangerous. That's very dangerous. He was not prayed up. You know well, you know what? That's what I'm, I've often wondered. He wasn't prayed up and something got on to him. That's more than likely. He wasn't prayed or fasted up. There you go. That's the thing. 
You don't go and fight devils in the arm of flesh. You do not. You better make sure before you go at the enemy. Let me put it like this. In the book of Jude, chapter number, or it ain't got no chapters, excuse me. It's only one chapter. Jude, verse number 9. That book always messes me up. Jude, verse number 9. The Bible said that Michael, which is the archangel, he is the general of angels in heaven. Michael, Satan come at him and said, Michael, where's the bones of Moses at? I want to know where Moses is buried at. Yeah. And Michael said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Michael didn't say, I'm fixing to lay you out or I'm fixing, you better go home. And you see, Michael said these words, the Lord rebuke thee. Because Michael realized that his, he didn't have the strength to fight that devil. His strength lies in God Almighty. And we will be much better off if you and I learn that. You can tell the devil where to go, but you better be prayed up and fasted up. You better know God and you better be forgiven and have the blood applied to your life. You don't walk in the enemy's camp by yourself. You better make sure the Father's going before you. The Lord's there with you and the Holy Ghost is inside of you. Because if you go in the enemy's camp, you could run out of their neck like the seven sons of Sceva did. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. You know, oh, yes. Yes. I've just had that feeling. Exactly. I mean, That's right. You know, That's you right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. Yes. That presence. Yes. That's it. And so you need to be prayed up. Because if we're not prayed up, things can attach to you. And it stays with you. That's exactly right. You know why? A lot of people, they don't, some people don't agree with this, but a lot of people are sick and ill because of a spirit. A spirit of infirmity. They stay sick all the time. A lot of people have the spirit of, of uh, addiction. Some people have the spirit of this and that. Some people, the spirit of suicide. I told you all this story. Well, young man that was here last week that said on this scene, his son got baptized. Good Christian man. And, and he, he was going to church all the time then. He drove a train. Oh, yeah. He got up there to Winfield, Alabama, and a guy was squatted down by the track. And said so they laid on the horn. I'm talking about laid on the horn. And said so this guy wouldn't move. And he still laid on the horn, hollering and then screaming and throwing his hands out that wind to move. And said so about the time he took the curve right there and got close, the guy laid out on the track. They hit the brakes, but you ain't stopping that big train. And right then, and right there, you know what happened? When he left there that day, he, he was heartbroken. He was messed up. I'm talking about we prayed for hours and hours and hours with this guy. He was messed up. And he wouldn't mind me saying this because he shared it at the last church. I'm, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't care. He told me, he said, Brother Chad, I love my family more than anything in this world. More than anything, my wife and kids is my number one, other than God. And he said, we went to Captain D's the other night. And as I'm sitting in Captain D's, he said, hatred, hatred. I've never felt such hatred. And he said, it was not against me. He said, it was me hating my family. This is a week after that happened. He goes, he said, I jumped up right then slammed the chair and walked out and called somebody else to come pick him up. He told them, y'all drive home. I'll see y'all later. And he had to go. Had to pray. Yeah. Then the next few days later, he's a big deer hunter. He went out in the deer blinds or whatever you call the deer stand. And as he's sitting there waiting on a deer, a voice popped in his head, just go ahead and take yourself out. Nobody loves you. This man's never, ever been that way. Nobody cares for you. Nobody loves you. You murdered a man. All this is coming up in his head, speaking to him. You want to know what happened? And we, we talked and we prayed for, for hours and hours and hours. But it wasn't where it was supposed to be that day when that train hit that guy. 
and that spirit of suicide that was on that man got on to him. Yes, sir. Followed him home. Went with him yes, everywhere he went. That spirit was attached to him. Yes, Don't tell me demons are not real. I can tell you story after story yes, after yes, story. Yes, if you believe in angels, you better believe in demons because they're real. Yes. Demons were yes. angels until they followed Satan and were cast out. And so let me go back to this. The first fall is when God kicks Satan out of heaven. The second fall of Satan is when God kicks him out of heaven permanently for good. He's cast down to the earth where there they will be limited in these bodies, earthly bodies. But yeah, so he, yes. he couldn't drive a train no more. He quit the job. Yeah, yeah. He, he had to end up. He yes. no more. He just tormented him. So it bad. tormented him. It tormented that poor boy. I'm telling you, yes, it did. And the Bible said, so the great dragon was cast out, and his angels were cast out with verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of this Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. In other words, right here, this was not God talking. This was not an angel talking. Why do you say that, Brother Chad? Let's read it, just the first part of it. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. The accuser of our brothers and our sisters. In other words, this ain't an angel talking. This ain't God talking. This is somebody that has lived this life. This is somebody that could be your brother or your sister. I personally believe it might have been one of the, the either the twelve apostles or the twelve disciples or the uh, excuse me, the twelve tribes. It could be, or it could just be somebody in heaven that God is using to show John this this verse right here. That's besides the point. But I just wanted you to know. Listen, it says the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Look, verse 11. I'm going to end the next two, two more verses. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the dead. There's something special about this right here. Because the Bible said, and they overcame him. Woo. Yeah. Why, why was there war in heaven to begin with? This is where, this hit me a while ago as I'm coming to church. Why did the war start in heaven? I'll tell you why. Praise God. This is, this is what I feel in my spirit. I don't know. This may be wrong. You get your interpretation. Pray and seek God. But this is what I was feeling. Because right after the rapture of the church, the devil sees that he lost a lot of people that he thought he had a hold of. The devil's going to be mad. And he's going to be like, no, those were mine. Those were mine. You see, when you pray to the Lord and ask God for forgiveness, you don't belong to Satan anymore. Christ frees you. And who the Son sets free is truly free indeed. Amen. You don't belong to the enemy anymore. Christ died to set you free. And I believe the enemy's going to be so mad when he sees the church of the living God rise up and meet the Lord in the air. And he's going to march his little prancy self into heaven and say, that's mine. But I'm going to tell you what. God's going to say, I died for them. And they accepted my home. They accepted the blood of Jesus. They accepted the blood of the Lamb. Because right here, the Bible says, and they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. What is the blood of the Lamb? The <clears throat> Jesus, the Spirit of God, Jesus, the, the blood of home. You see, we talk about the blood a lot at church, but it should never, as a Christian, it should never be a, a magician's word to us like abracadabra. Oh, yeah. 
Because a lot of people will, will say that the blood of Jesus compels you and they don't even know what they're talking about. It's not the physical blood either. It's not the physical blood. was the one that stuck the sword in the side. If, if that was the case, you know they got blood. That's right. They didn't hear that. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not physical blood. It is a spiritual blood. It is us receiving His blood atonement. Yeah, yeah. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you of all unrighteousness. And this is what Charles Spurgeon said, Brother Randall. I love it. He said the blood of Jesus should not be a pillar for us to rest our weariness on. It should be a weapon that we use to subdue our sins. In other words, it should not be just a word we use just to get a, well, the blood of Jesus is enough that's going to get me to heaven. No, it should be the weapon you use to crucify your flesh and walk freely in Christ. I'm talking about a lot of Christians are beat down. They're still living in sin because, well, the blood of Jesus is going to get me to heaven. I'm still living in sin. Listen, has Christ died and set you free? Are you still entangled again with the yoke of bondage? Because the Bible said if you're living in sin, you are crucifying Jesus afresh. The blood will wash your sins away. That's right. The blood will wash your sins away. But if it becomes just a pillow to rest your weariness on, if it just helps ease your mind and you don't truly know what the blood is, then I question your salvation at all. I'm not God and I'm not judging you. But I will say this. If you don't accept Jesus as the perfect Lamb of God Amen. who died to redeem you, then you don't know Jesus. Because Jesus, His love, he, Jesus is redemption. Jesus is salvation. Jesus is grace. He is mercy. Jesus, it's not something that you should, the blood of Jesus, they, these people overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. They applied it to their life. Brother Tim, what's so amazing is that when I kneel down at the altar and I say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and wash me in your blood and, and, and cleanse me, God. What happens when I stand up? I am free as free can be because my sins have been washed away and they have been forgiven. They have been washed and they have been cast away as far as the east is from the west. I'm talking about the blood atonement for your sins is real. The Bible said, God, don't just sweep your sins under the rug and bring them back up, but God abundantly pardons us. Abundantly pardons. You can, yes. Yes, sir. That's right. If you ever feel shackled down, do it, brother. It will change you. You know what? The blood of Jesus is not something you see with your physical eyes, but in the spirit. If you can see with your spiritual eyes right now, let me tell you what happens. When you ask for forgiveness, when you say, God, forgive me, something begins to happen. Yeah. Oh, God. He begins to rain down. There's a fountain. There is a fountain that still flows, that if you get under that fountain, it will cleanse you. That fountain is still running today, brother. Steve Odom, I mean, the blood of Jesus does never run dry. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. What's the old song, Brother Tim, that we used to sing? Are you washed? Or no, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Or evil, or how they go, victory over evil. The victory win or something other like that. There's wonderful power in the blood. Amen. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. These people overcome. Yes. The devil cannot. That's it. This is amazing because the devil. How many in here fights the devil? Let's be honest. Every day. How many in here fights the devil? Everybody. Every day. Like you said, if you don't, you better check yourself. If you don't, you better check yourself. I'm thankful that every one of y'all fights the devil. That's it. What's that you said? Sometimes a thought comes in your head and you're like, wait a minute. That's right. As long as it don't, you 
Yes, that's right. Cast it as soon as that thought pops in your mind. We we said you can't help it that a bird flies over your hair, over your head, but you can. Right. You can't help the thoughts that pop in, but you can't help whether you sit and think on it. You know, and I believe that if we stop and think and allow that to stay there, we dwell on it, that becomes sin. That's right. You have the power to cast down imaginations and make it give up and obey Christ. The Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's a stronghold. Your mind is a stronghold. Because a lot of people, their battles they fight is fighting right here. That's where it starts. In the mind. And then when it starts in here, then it begins to take place everywhere else. That's why the Bible says you do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need our minds renewed every day. How do we get them renewed? By the blood of Jesus. That's how we overcome. Lord, cover me by your blood. And it's not an abracadabra word. It is the real McCoy. It is the real Christos. Let me put it that way. It's like we talk Sunday at the house. You have to crucify your flesh daily. Crucify daily. Yes, sir. Daily you have to crucify that flesh. That's right. That's right. That's why people on Sunday morning wake up and they can talk themselves out of going to church. Saying, yes. I don't feel good and just keep on having those thoughts. And That's right. Know it. You I bring that stuff that. into existence. You birth that. That's right. Yes. Yes. You do. yes. You genuinely do. That's right. And this is the thing. They overcome it by the blood of the Lamb. You just got to say the blood of Jesus has healed me. Because when the devil, when you wake up on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night, a lot of times when you get off work, you're tired, and, and the devil's going to tell you, you don't feel like going. You're wore out, you're beat, you know, you need to rest, and you got this to do, and you got that to do. You need to say, but Jesus didn't stop on me. He went to the cross. He shed his blood for me. He went to the grave, and he fought death, hell, and the grave for me. And then on day three, he rose up. So if he rose from the dead, I can rise from the bed. Hallelujah. I'm talking about Jesus. The blood of Jesus saved me. And I'm not giving up. The blood of Jesus saved me. The blood of Jesus healed me. You can overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Let me put it this way. When the devil sees you, if you're washed in the blood, he don't see you anymore. He sees the Jesus in you. He sees Christ in you. He don't see your goodness, Brother Steve. He sees Christ's goodness. You see, the Bible says that Christ's righteousness has been imputed to every one of us. Yours and my righteousness, that means our goodness or, or, or what, how we live, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that's why our righteousness will never get us to heaven. We all fall short. Every one of us in this room tonight, we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us does. I do, you do, we all do. That don't give us a license to sin, but it gives us the freedom to praise God saying, I know I'm not good enough, but because of who you are, you overcome. You are victorious, and now your victory is my victory. And because you were triumphant, now I'm triumphant. Because you were holy, now I'm holy. Because of the blood of the Lamb. Because of the blood. Because Christ went and took your place and my place when he hung high. He spread his arms out open wide. I'm talking about naked for all the world to see. He was buried, but he had your sins on and my sins. He took your place and he took my place. And there was a show around that cross that day. I know y'all hear me say it all the time, but the devil and his angels was there that day walking all around. But the God, God made a show of the devil openly. Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says Jesus made a show of them openly. What did Jesus do? The law that nobody could fulfill. The law that had everybody in bondage 
The Bible said Jesus took that and he nailed it onto that cross. He nailed it onto the cross. He lived it and he lived a righteous life. And he lived it because he knew you and I couldn't live it. He knew that you and I failed him and would fail him. But Jesus said, I want to go and I will impart my righteousness to you. Brother Gary. Yes. The reason he, the, uh, the devil gets so mad is because he sees Jesus in us. That's right, yes. And as long as he sees Jesus in us, he's going to be mad at us. He's going to throw everything he can at yes. us. Yes. Try to get us to turn on him like Michael did. That's right, absolutely. But he also gives us power to overcome. Yes, he did. And we got to use that power. Absolutely. And the only way that we can keep that power is in this word. That's in that word. That's it. We keep it, the word in our heart. Absolutely. We can help others along our life journey that don't know Jesus. Yes. That's right. And getting back to the lesson that you're talking about. Uh huh. Russia and Ukraine. See, if Russia can overtake Ukraine, uh huh. They're gonna get the the place where all the wheat. Is uh huh. And they already got the other stuff, so they're going to. Russia trying to get hold of that, so yes. it can have to depend on them for the food. Right. And that can't happen. Exactly. God is going to take care of that. Amen. Amen, brother. And I believe that with all my heart. Amen. So I've been praying that Ukraine would somehow get help to yes. overcome Russia. That's it. That's it. And they've already killed 12,000 Russians. Yes. So they're doing a good job on their own. That's right. But I do believe it's because of the Jews that might be in Russia. Yes. Got God on their mind. Yes. They're, they're doing some praying. That's them. right. And, and it's our job to pray for them. It the sure is. We need to pray for the Ukrainian yes. people. That's right. Each and every day. Absolutely. That the Lord will give them power. Yes. Give them strength. Yes. To overcome the devil. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is Putin. Every, every, yes. Everything you, you look at, they sit double down on Putin to assassinate him. Yes. Well, I don't know about all that, but I might shout a little bit if it happens. Amen. But I think it's a donut. That's right. That's right. That's, that's what it's boiling down to. That's it. That's it. And we've got to keep the people in our prayer. Yes, sir. See, we can't keep God in a box. That's right. We got to let God out. We, we got to let, let God fill this body Amen. and come out of this body yes. before we get on another. Yes. You're talking about that, that woman, that woman you're talking about, that uh -huh. big woman. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I was at a church one night. Uh huh. And he was casting a young girl, a uh -huh. really young girl. Yes, sir. I'd say in her early teens. Uh huh. And she was a shouting and a hollering and all kinds of stuff coming out. Of her mouth, uh -huh. she hadn't been coming out of a young girl. Right. And they started praying, trying to get the devil out of that girl. And the preacher said, All of you that ain't got been saved long or ain't got God in your heart, right uh -huh. now, need to have yes. to go back up. Right. So if you don't, the spirit can get into you. Yes. Right. Well, they prayed for that girl. And I was standing by the door before I get out of there. That's right. <laughs> I've never seen nothing like that. Yes, sir. And I prayed this girl. And I've seen it. That stuff come out of her mouth from just old green slimy yes. stuff. And it was just creeping along on the floor. And I knew then what that preacher told me. Yes. It could get into you. Yes. That's a spirit. That's right. And uh, and. I got out. Yes. I just been playing on it. I got out of it. That's right. Because it scared me. Yes. And I've never been around nothing like that like you. That's right. That's well, it. Your wife, it, it. It can hit on. Brother. That's right. It can. It sure can, brother. There's been times we've uh, we've cast out. Brother Bruce has been with us. And uh, we'll be praying for somebody casting out some devils. Yeah. And they have to go get the garbage can. And they, and they would begin to throw up. And they would just be the black as black as that bag right there. Just black as coal, wasn't it? I'm talking about just nasty. You know what that is? That's evil. That spirit's coming out. That's the darkness that has been taking up residence in their body. 
I'm telling you, well, what, that hey, it's real. Came up here. I'm not going to call whose mother it was. Uh huh. But somebody that went to church. Uh huh. And you could hear the groaning and hurt. Mm. And you was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely right. <clears throat> In the, I'm going to finish the lid. I have, I've had them on my back, bro, Chad. Uh-huh. Go in the house like that, pray, and that's why I get on my back. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, We've been in the middle of prayer before, and then, oh, well, matter of fact, we was having Bible study, and we finished Bible study, and we got everybody up, and we prayed, and as we were praying, this woman that we were praying for screamed to the top of her lungs. She said, they're on me, they're on me. Yeah. And at the end of the service, she kept saying, my, my back, my shoulder was right up here on the yeah. left shoulder blade. And she said, my shoulder blade is on fire. Well, she got Son and a few other women to look at it. And when she pulled her shirt down, I mean, it was claw marks. Yeah. Were, I mean, and it was fresh. It yeah. was still red around the claw mark. I'm talking about while we were sitting there praying, they were after her. Amen. You know, it's one, real. I want to help me you went to Yes. And that's where it was. One place it got on my back. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. That's it, bro. Absolutely. Randall, if we ain't scared you yet, we're... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you come to a devil cast now, church, bro. Listen, you knew he was crazy. He knows how I am. I, he listens to me every day. You knew he was crazy. He listens to me every day, don't you? Yeah. Oh, good. And so they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to give you the two others, and we'll read that last verse, and we'll, we'll hit on it next week. But they'll come by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. When the devil looks at you, he don't see. He sees the blood. Amen. Amen. I'm going to put it to you like this. The blood of the Lamb, what does it do to us? Have y'all ever had like a little three or four-year-old, five-year-old, that always wanted to wrestle with you. Does anybody know what oh, yeah. They always want to fight. <laughs> Just say you're six foot tall. Or even four foot tall. They're usually about two foot tall. And you put your hands on them like that. And they're just a swinging. Y'all got that visual? They're just a swinging, but they can't reach you. Let me tell you, that's what the blood of the lamb does for you. Because the devil... When you have the blood applied to your life, the devil's just a little better. Not much bigger than a squirrel. I'm talking about, and that devil likes to swing, but he can't touch you because you've got the blood of Jesus applied to your life. You know how Rocky had the flag and all behind him? Whenever the devil comes and you got the blood, the Bible says when the enemy comes in one way, he's going to leave seven because that right. banner. That blood-stained banner is going to rise up behind you. When he sees that blood, he's got to go. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the first way to overcome the enemy is by the blood of the Lamb. The second one is by what? Word of your testimony. The word of your testimony. There's a second way to beat the devil. When he tries to come at you and tries to deceive you or tries to lie, excuse me, lie to you or whatnot, you have your testimony that God has already delivered you from. So you already know the devil is dumb, the devil is a liar, the devil is a loser. You know, like it was that show, Loser. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The old seven weenie is a loser. He's lost. The devil is a vanquished foe. He's lost the battle. And you need to understand that, that you are not fighting an enemy. You are fighting somebody that's already lost the battle. It's over with. It's written. it's written. It's done. All he is is trying to just, uh, what do they call that? Instigate. Just keep on and on and on. Aggravate. That's right. Get you off track. And just sit there and pass you. But the devil is a liar. He says he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may be a roaring lion, but he's a toothless lion. He can't bite you. That's he has only has the power that we give him. He only has the power you give him. So we overcome by the what? The blood of the Lamb. And by the what? Testimony. That's right. So if he can't lie to you, if he can't because you already have the testimony of what God, you've already had the experience of what God's done for you, you already know, devil, you're lying. God's already delivered me once and I know he'll do it again. So you have the word of your testimony. 
And then they did not love their lives unto death. What does that mean? It means you don't love this earthly life so much that you love God more. Right. You become like the Apostle Paul that you say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So when the enemy comes and tries to threaten you, that's all it is, is threats to you. And you can say, devil, whatever you're going to try to throw my way, I know my God is enough. Amen. You can throw all you want to, but I've got all the, the, the arm, my spiritual armor on, and I know that all your fiery darts is going to be quenched. Yes, sir. All of them is going to be quenched because I've got my weapon. I've got my warfare, my armor on. And the Bible says, where are we at? They overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives unto the dead. So if he can't threaten you, if he can't deceive you, what good is he? He's not no good. He's not no good. He only can do to you what you let him do. Yes. That's right. He'll leave you alone. That's it. That's the way the enemy has to because if we're submitted to God, when we give him our testimony, he has to flee. Has to flee. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. There you go. There you go. And there's your testimony. That's it. And that's the way, you know, you, you go through something so that you can share a testimony with someone else to help them overcome. You know, a lot of people go through things and you're like, well, I don't know why, Lord, why I'm here. Yeah, why did I go through it myself? That's right. You may not know why you're here now, but there will be a day when you'll know exactly why you went through it. He wants you to see what evil is. That's right. He wants you. To say that. That's see right. how mighty and able he truly is. That's yeah, right. I'm here to tell you. After this week, this right here, this gets home. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> this gets home hard. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. That's it. Was you through, brother? Hey, that's it. That's it. Huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to the dead. I'm going to read this and we're going to close. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. He knows he has a short time. I'm, not, I'm going to save that for next week. But we know the devil knows. His time is running out. He's already defeated He's a guy in expiration day. We had some milk the other day, brother. And I just had to open that lid to smell it. I didn't trust the expiration day. There wasn't but a day out. I said, maybe it's still good. No. Don't do that. If this says March 9th, trust me, it's March 9th. It don't mean March 10th is still good. But that's where the devil is. The devil thinks he can push it another day. He knows his time's running short. He's got an expiration date on him. You know what the good thing is about us, though? If we're born again, you don't have an expiration date. We're going to live forever with our Lord and Savior. I told you the two falls. I'll tell you the other two falls. I told you the devil falls four times. I'll tell you the other four next week. Uh, just something to be thinking about this week. Ponder, don't you?